Well, it's definite integration. What we learned previously is that we have a small f, okay? And then what? This gives us a big f, or another word, a big f and a small f. Come here is d, come here is in, and this is not a one to one map, and it's not bijective, not subjective, it's not injective. We are defining indefinite integral by differentiation. There's no number here. Now, we suddenly have something like this, area under the curve. You can think of this simple. It's just a very fancy way of writing area under the curve. Okay, x squared from 1 to 2. You can think of it as a, something like this. And it just happened when people write this, they somehow write this symbol that is exactly this symbol, and then put a 1 here and put a 2 here. This thing, which the name is called definite integral, is not this thing. So indefinite integral and definite integral are two separate things. For those who learn calculus in high school, you also know that I can calculate this by this and then find a big F and then fill in the number in 1, 2. This is because of a theorem called fundamental theorem of calculus. At this moment, you don't know what is this, so therefore this arrow doesn't exist, so therefore these two things are different things. That means, how do we define integration? We define integration by differentiation. Now, I'm not going to talk anything about differentiation. I'm going to talk about this thing by area under the curve. Area under the curve. So there's no differentiation. So that's for this thing and the thing you learned this morning and last week, totally irrelevant. Then what's that? Suppose I have y equal x squared. I want to find an area from x1 to x2. So I want to find x1 and x2. This is inclusive. That means x1, x2 are included. So that's why I write a square bracket. You can think of, I want to find anything for x between this region. I want to find the yellow region. So I have a region, yellow region. So that means what? That means this thing actually is a geometry problem. Find the region here. But unlike the classical geometry, which is basically triangle, square, parallelogram, this is a curved thing. So therefore, we don't know what is this area, right? But we know the following. This yellow region is always larger than this square, right? Why? Because this square is saying that I perform an underestimation. What does that mean? From this one, I have my wire. So this is the y. And then for the two, supposedly I should use the value here, but now I don't. I use the same value here, and I keep going in this way. Then it gives me this region, right? Then yellow is larger than the red. Red is what? One. Because this rectangle box is, well, actually should be a square. This x-axis and y-axis are not in the same uh, scale, so this should be a square. This is what? This represents yellow area, okay? Then this is yellow area. This inequality say that yellow area strictly larger than 1. I'm not saying larger than or equal, I'm saying strictly larger than. Then in the opposite direction, I can say, instead of f1, I use the heights of f2. I have a green region, right? Then my green region will be larger than my yellow region. Now, here's the starting point. When you see this squeeze is coming, what I'm going to do, now suppose in the x-axis, I chop it into two intervals. So the idea is, previously, I have one box. This is my starting point. This is my ending point. I have one shape. The shape is a rectangular box. Now, I suddenly have a middle guy here. And then now, what? Because I have two points, so it's the same as I have this. And I repeat what I just did for each of this small region. I have this region. I do an under area, under approximation, so it gives me this box. I can calculate this box, right? Because I know the x value, I know the y value, I get a number. Again, and then I start with this region. I know the x value, I know the y value, I also get a number, right? So you calculate the number, you get this. So yellow region between this and this. And I can, again, do an upper approximation. So I now overestimate the area. So, but again, I have two regions. So now I have refined this number. And now you should see what I'm going to do. I have some unknown, which is a question mark. What I'm going to do? I want to, I'm going to build two sequences here. These two sequences, what? Will keep moving until, in the end, they all meet this number. Then I find this number. This is definite integral. Did I talk about anything differentiation? No, where's the D? There's no D, OK? I'm not going to talk about the detail here, but you see the point. So if I do it again, what is this? Originally, I have one interval. Here, I chop it one time. Now what I'm doing? I have two interval, right? I chop it again. So now I have four interval. And then for four interval, I can again do the upper estimation and the lower estimation. So this is the lower estimation, and this is upper estimation. And then I calculate, because this is just box rectangle, I know the width and know the height, then I can calculate the area. So I improve this number. OK, so now I have improved this number. In the very beginning, the number is 1 and 4, a very bad number. Now at this stage, I have 1.9 something and 2.7 something. If I repeat this for many times, 
Then I have a formula that looks like this. This yellow thing is the area under the curve for 1 to 2, which is a non-polynomial thing, which is something with a smooth uh, curve thing, which is something we don't know. Okay, then what we are going to do? We use a bunch of box to form an upper bound and a lower bound. So in this case, I have how many box? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 box. So n here is 10. Each of this small rectangular box, what's the width? My starting point is 1. My ending point is 2. Let me call my starting point A and I ending point B. So what's the width here? B minus A divided by n. So it's 0 0.1. So for this guy, what's the x value here? This is the starting point plus 3 times the h, right? So this guy, the x value will be the starting point, which is A, which is 1 in this case, plus how many h? How many rectangular box? So this is 3 h. Then what is this particular f value? It will be the f of this value, right? Which in this case is a square. This is the y value. The x value is this particular location, which is a plus 3h. You also have this x value, right? Which is a plus 4h. Then what is this gap? Again, this gap is just h, right? So therefore, the area of a one particular rectangular box is something like this, right? So which is this? And then I have 10 box. So I do this 10 times, add them up. This bracket with a square is exactly this, OK? So this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I can use a number to represent this i. OK, this i is not complex number i. This i is an index, OK? And therefore, I have this. Then I can now, what? This is actually a code. You do this for 10 box, you get this number. This is underestimation. What about overestimation? Well, you just change this part from 3 to 4. You are using the letter 1 for your height. Then you get the same thing. So now you have improved this. OK, now revision. If I have a sequence a n and c n squeezing b n and my a n c n in the end limit converts to the same l, then the limit of b n converts to the same l. Then you may wonder, oh, there's no limit here. Who cares? There's no limit here. This can be a constant sequence. So basically, my b n, my b n is a sequence, so it's a bunch of number, and all this number is this big chunk of thing. So that means I have a sequence that I keep writing this many times. It's a sequence, right? So this is my sequence, and then what's my a n sequence? My a n sequence is 1, and then 1 1.6 something, 1.9 something, 2.1 something, so my, I have an A sequence here, okay? And then what's my C sequence? C sequence is 4 and then to 2. So you can say my A sequence is something like this, my C sequence is something like this, then if my B is a constant, then in the end if they reach 1 point, then I know where's B. Now you see, I define integration by limit. I did not do anything differentiation. It's not antiderivative. That's why this thing is not indefinite interval. This integration has nothing to do with the previous integration. They are two different things. So this is the idea. I just said I have a sequence A, which have this number, which is increasing. Okay. This guy also decreasing, monotonically decreasing. So my B is this integration. It's just a bunch of constant stuff. I rewrite it every time. Then what is this value? It will be somewhere here, which I don't know. But if I keep going on, I get the value. So that's the idea. So that means what? This is a limit. So this limit is found by Riemann. So what is this? I have a curve. I have my starting point. This is starting point. I call, call this starting point A. And I'm going to chop this interval from A to B, right? So let's say this is B. I'm going to chop this interval. How many parts? I'm going to chop it n part. So each of these small boxes is what? Is B minus A divided by n, right? So I have this as my H. Then what is this? A adding how many H? So if I is 3, that means a plus 3h. Recap, summation is for loop, OK? So if this i is 3, that means adding 1h, OK? Adding 1h, adding 2h, adding 3h. So I'm here. Then the corresponding f value means I go to here, OK? And then multiply h means I multiply this, so I have this particular region. And what? This region will be summed into this thing. Before I take limit, okay, ignore the limit for a moment. So I sum. So that means I have this figure. I add a bunch of area, right? <clears throat> and I'm going to make this rectangular box, especially this edge, as small as possible. I'm doing a very big box. Then you will argue, oh, this is very bad. Why? Because this area is so big. So I make a smaller rectangle. So now the area is smaller, right? You then you say, no, no, no. Uh, if I zoom it in, it's still big. Okay. I still do the same thing. Then you will say, no, 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 I can still zoom in. OK, again, the argument. You disagree with me, then I find again all your disagreement. 
whenever I say this is the area, oh, you disagree with me, okay, then I say I can keep going smaller. This infinite argument, you disagree with me, I fight back your disagreement, and then you disagree with me again, I fight back your disagreement, is exactly the limit. So we have this n go to infinity. That means what? In the end, in infinity, we are not drawing this anymore. We are drawing something like this, okay? And here's the crazy thing. What's the crazy thing? The width of this line is zero. So that means you cannot draw things. Because what? What's h? h is b minus a divided by n. So I have 1 over n, n go to infinity. So you know, limit 1 over n, n go to infinity, this guy go to 0. So that means in the end, I have what? I have a bunch of things that have zero width. I have something like something 0 and something infinity number of terms added together. So I actually have in determinant form, I have infinity times 0, something like this. What we are going to do? We are going to say, well, to resolve this kind of problem, we just need to make sure this kind of error does not occur before we take the limit. So that's why we have this big chunk of thing. So we are going to fix this issue by looking at what the heck is this guy, and then kills the troublemaker. Then we take the limit. Then we can say, oh, this guy is not those infinity times zero. We no need to use L hospital rule. Let's do it. For x square, my f is x square, right? So this term become what? Become this term. What is this? Anything here, I put a square here. And what is h? h is b minus a divided by n. So I have b minus a divided by n. The b is 2, a is 1, so I substitute here. This is h. h is b minus a divided by n, so 2 minus 1 divided by n. So I have just replaced the symbol by their number. OK, nothing new. So I get something like this. So I get this. Then what? I have a bracket with a power. I just, what? a square b square 2ab. OK, I got this. Then what? I put this guy inside. I can do that, right? Then I have 1 times 1 over n, 1 over n, 2i n times 1 over n, 2i over n squared, i squared divided by n squared, so i squared divided by n cubed, so now I have this. So I'm going to do, put this here, put this here, and put this here. Notice that I'm not saying put this here. I'm saying put the summation sign. Okay, I put the summation sign here, then I get this term. So now I have this. This is on what? On i. It's not on n. This is on n. So I can remove anything that's not, not on i here. So this guy have no i. So I put this as a constant, I put it here. So this guy basically is a bunch of one added together. Then what about this? This one, n squared go out, so n squared here. The two is not i, so two go here, so I got i here. This guy, n cube go out, so n cube here, and i squared stay there. Now this part is tricky. This is what? This is a bunch of number added together for one. So it's one plus one plus one plus one, n time. Of course, this is n. This one is one plus two plus three plus four plus five. So you have a formula, triangle number. You have this. This one is square. OK, you have a formula which looks like this. Then you will ask, how do I get from here to here? Mathematical induction. OK, so I have this. Then what? This is the part that resolve the infinity times 0. Because now you can see n and n die, become 1. Limit constant function, always constant, so 1. This one, q is n, 2 times 2, q, gone. n plus 1 divided by n is this. I just keep it here, OK? This one, n become power 2, so I have this thing. The 6, I go out, so now I have this one. Now I put the limit inside. This one, okay, I assume you know this limit is easy, okay? And then this one, again, you just divide the whole thing by 1 over n squared on top and on the bottom, okay? Then you get this. Then you take limit. This guy is 0. This guy is 0. This guy is 0. So you have 1 plus 1 plus 2 over 6, which is 7 over 3. Let me recap. You have this. This is indefinite integral. There's no number here. This process means find a big F such that if you d the big F give you the small f. If I do this, I ignore the number from the beginning. And then I solve this integration. This big F is x cubed divided by 3. Why? Because I differentiate this guy, give me x squared, right? And now, here's this, this symbol means I take from 2 and subtract from 1. That means I put 2 into this function and then subtract 1 put into this function. It gives me 2 cubed divided by 3, 1 cubed divided by 3, which is this. It's the same number. That means what? This big chunk of n is also the big F, the original primitive function, the antiderivative f b minus f a. Okay, this says a lot of things. First of all, let me just tell you, this is fundamental theorem of calculus, and also because they are equal. That means if this guy does not exist, let's say this is something divided by zero, you can tell this limit does not exist. Or you want to find this limit, try to build a f, then you can find a limit. So again, let me say this. Do not underestimate this symbol. This means you can go from here, and you can also go from here. Very likely, people think that this is easy, but this is not. This is just an example. 
Coming from here, very easy. Coming from here is not. And all the things that makes math wow, have a wow moment, is basically this part. So we are just defining everything using limit. There's no differentiation here. OK, so this is the idea. Now, this thing is called Lebesgue. The S is not pronounced. Why I'm going to talk about this? Because this guy basically says that, I'm sorry, Riemann, you are wrong. OK, now I'm going to tell you a crazy thing. What's the story? OK, I have this, and then this rectangle, the width getting smaller, it will approximate my region very well. But what if I have some crazy function that I suddenly have a jump? OK, then I, I, what happened here? We don't know. So is this, does it mean this function is not integratable? Yes. For this kind of function, Riemann integral doesn't work. But this guy come up with a rescue. Who said that you have to chop things vertically? Why don't you chop things horizontally? So I'm going to talk about what the heck is this. You don't need to worry about this thing in exam. I'm not going to ask you. Let me tell you, even pure math student year one, if I ask this, they all fail. This one is very tough. This one is the hardest thing in calculus. It's called measure theory. What the heck is this? So Lebec said that, why chop x-axis? Why don't we chop y-axis? Instead of chopping here, chop, 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 why don't we chop here? Chop, 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 chop. What's the difference? Oh, the difference is very big. This is interesting. So let's say we want to solve this. We can do the same thing as the Riemann sum again. That means I plot this. So this is the function. And then what? I chop, 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 chop. This function is both Riemann integratable and Lebesgue integratable. This is an easy function. OK, for function that is Riemann not integratable, but Lebesgue integratable is too difficult for this level. So I'm not going to use that. So now I'm going to use this, but talk about chop in the y axis. So I'm going to say, OK, chop this, chop this, chop this. Got the idea, right? So I'm going to chop the y-axis into interval right like this. So this kind of thing looks very complicated. No. Previously, I chopped the x-axis. This is a, this is b. I chopped it as an h, right? Now, I want to avoid confusion. For the y-axis, I don't use h. I use epsilon, OK? So I chop it like this. You can think of each of this is epsilon. Actually, this epsilon is actually the epsilon delta epsilon. So anyway. And then what? So I have zero epsilon, this this right? Epsilon to two epsilon. So this region, the k position to the k plus one position. Okay, so it's something like this. So I chop this, and then well, from here, what's the value of h and a b? H is b minus a divided by n, right? Now I have to chop the y-axis, so I call it c d. Same. So I have a starting point c and an ending point d, and I have n. So what is the epsilon? D minus c divided by n. Same. Okay, nothing new. I just chop from x-axis to y-axis. Nothing new. The following part is not easy. OK, what the heck is this? I want to find the value of the f such that they are belonging to this region. This is the part that makes this Lebesgue integral insane. So for the Riemann integral, easy. For whatever x, I always know the f. Now it's not the same. It's now I'm looking from the f. I go back to the x. So I need an additional work. What? From a particular f value, I go back to see where is the x. But since now, I have what? I have a region. This is epsilon. This is 2 epsilon. Let's say this is the first uh, second box. This is 0. Then I have a curve right here, right? So I need what? I'm saying I need this region. So I need to go from here. Let me use color. From here, do, 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 here. So this is what? This is the starting point of f such that it will within this region and then do, 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 do. so i need to find this what is this pre-image do you remember set theory function domain codomain image pre-image this is called pre-image of a particular image so pre means before so i need to find a pre-image so what's my f f is one minus x squared so i want my one minus x squared between what between a particular value, y value, right? So I want to find from this particular y value, bounding the f, and I want to go back to my x. Got it, right? So here are just a bunch of algebra. Give me this. And now I have something that looks like this. Looks like what? Absolute value. That's why I said last month, everything in calculus that is causing trouble is most likely is the absolute value. This thing, I go to here, but this is absolute value, not just square root and x. You ignore the negative part. So now I have this. OK, I just take square root, but this part becomes absolute value. I have this, then what? Part 1, let me call it part 1. And then this is part 2, let me call this part 2. OK, 
because you are having absolute value. So you have another two inequality, and this gives you another two inequality. So therefore, actually, from this line, oh, easy, you have two inequality. But no, now you have four inequality. This is the tricky part. And because of time, I'm going to jump. Otherwise, this lecture is a two hour. So this four inequality, after you draw it on the line and make sure all the and or not condition is correct, you can write an expression that looks like this. X will be somewhere from here to here or somewhere here to here. Oh, complicated. No, easy. Suppose this is my graph. And this is the region I want to touch in my y-axis. What is the x-axis value? That means the pre-image. This region or this region, right? This region is this region. This region is this region. If I have this as my y value, and I know this as my x, that after do the f, it will, the f will be within this region, then, then what? Then isn't this also something looks like area on the curve? So, in other words, let me first talk about the theory. So you want to find an epsilon. This is chopping the y, this is epsilon. Multiply how many x value are here such that the x after the f give you value within this epsilon. This is the meaning. This thing is, this thing is called pre-image. That means this two arrow here is a set. This mu means how long is this set. And this thing has a name called measure. And this is the nightmare of pure math students. Basically, the idea is this is epsilon, this is epsilon, this is epsilon, this is epsilon. So each of these box, the height is epsilon. I just need to multiply the height with, with respect to the, how, the width. That means this width. So if I have this width, multiply this height, it gives me a number. And then I do it repeatedly adding up, then these boxes give me the area under this curve. And this is what? This is Lebesgue integral. Yes, I just summarized something 36 hour, actually not should be 72 because this is year two thing, called measure theory into maybe five minutes. The hardest part is, how do you calculate this? Because it's possible, what? You can find a length of this guy. So this is a function that you don't know how to draw. If x is rational number, you put a one. So that means what, is zero rational? Yeah, so zero, this is zero, right? So zero is one. It's one rational, all the integer are rational. So all the integer here, you have a dot, 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 these are integer. Okay, you also have the decimal places, 1.5, 1.22, or one. So you have also a bunch of dots. But suddenly, square root is dot uh, here, and then square root 3 is not here, so you have some crazy function. That you cannot do Riemann integral, why? Because you have a hole here, how do you chop this? You, do you consider this area in the summation? We don't know. But if you chop it horizontally, it doesn't matter. So that's why you should chop it horizontally. And that's why this is Lebesgue integral, and that's why when you study analysis, nobody study Riemann integral, but you always study chopping from the y-axis. This function, if you do Riemann sum, is undefined, it's error. This thing, if you do what? Lebesgue integral, you can integrate. I'm now telling you, this thing integration is zero. This kind of thing is just formula. So if I assume this f are what? Riemann integrable function, that means simple stuff, not this kind of crazy thing, then this is saying that I have a starting point a, and then I have ending point, B. Now go back to chopping the x-axis. I have a bunch of rectangle box. Now I have G. G is what? Another function that looks like this. Then what does it mean? It means these two function, this function at this function, if I add them, then probably I will have some new function. I don't know how to draw, but anyway, you got an idea. Then of course, I chop this thing. After I add the function, it's the same as I chop them one by one, and then I add the value. So this is the idea. What about this? Well, I suddenly make this function go up two times. Of course, the order box be become two times bigger, and of course, you have this. What about this? A to B is the same as A to C and C to B. My function is like this, okay? Okay. Then I need to integrate from A to B, right? I can say I chop boxes from A go to suddenly here, and these are all zero. I don't count it, and then I go back to chop boxes from here. And I get split. This is a split. This is useful because let's say you have to chop function, but your function looks like this. This will be positive, this one will be negative, and then if you add the area, they will cancel out. So if I need to chop from negative 3 to positive 3, I can say I stop at 0, this gives me a bunch of number, and this is mirror image, so 0 to positive 3 will be mirror image of this number, so they add up, cancel out 0. So that's, this is the application. Now this is the most important thing. This is called indefinite integral, there's no number. This is called definite integral, it means area under curve. They are not the same thing, but turns out somebody found that they are related. What? This thing is the same as I have a big F, put the starting point and ending point and subtract each other. This is called fundamental theorem of calculus. So it's saying that if I have a function F, integrate under T, but up to a number X, this is the same as I have my original primitive function FX. So in this case, this X is like a what? A variable, it's change. 
So in other words, it says, I have a function, okay, this is my a, and I integrate until somewhere, let me call this x, okay, there will be a region here, right? This region is a number, so I can draw another function, this is my big F, the value of this function is exactly the area here, so in the very beginning, area is zero, so it's zero, and then if I slide this bar towards the right, the area increase, so the function should somehow look like this, okay, something like that, basically this is saying that. So how do you integrate this? We find the big F, which is this, and then put three into this big F, subtract one in this big F. Therefore, that's it. So you already know how to do this. The additional work here is just this minus sign. So therefore, definite integral is nothing about how you integrate stuff, because how you integrate stuff is the indefinite integral. Definite integral is about chopping boxes, which normally you chop boxes vertically like this, but I just cannot stop myself telling you you can chop boxes in the y-axis. 